Hello, everyone. It is September 3rd, 2021, and uh, this is a quick announcement about our reading group, the Patreon reading group that you can join. Uh, for the past five sessions over the past two or so months, uh, we went through a series of texts by Carl Jung and uh, discussed them with the group. They were really great, very stimulating, thought-provoking. But for now, we are done with Jung. Uh, at least directly, we are done directly dealing with him. And we are starting with another text. This text is a book on populist reason by Ernesto Leclau. So we are starting uh, about two weeks from now, a week or so from now, uh, with the first session uh, discussing the chapter one of this book. Uh, and in this video, I'm going to read the preface to the book to give you a flavor uh, of this, the author's style and what the book is about. If you like to read uh, more accessible introductions to the topic of populism, there are two that I have read. Um, I, I enjoyed one of them more than the other. Uh, the one that I enjoyed more is that uh, is from the series of very short introductions uh, from Oxford University Press. So the very short introduction to populism or populism, a very short introduction. Uh, the reason why I like that was because it was a very uh, conceptually tight and organized presentation. It was more, it was philosophical in a good way. The other one that I read was uh, from the Pelican series. I think that one was called Populism and the Failure of Liberal Democracy or the de Demise of, of Democracy or something like that, something along those lines. That was not as conceptually organized, but it was um, full of historical details. So that it, was, um, it contained a lot of facts, historical facts. And... Um, things that the authors wanted us to pay attention to. Uh, but it was, as I said, it was not conceptually as organized, as tightly organized as the first one. Uh, the first one was, was shorter as well. Uh, two other books that come to mind uh, when thinking about populism, um, one of them is by Francis Fukuyama. It's called Simply Identity. And that's okay. I wouldn't advise against reading it. The other one is a similar book by Eric Fromm, written and published uh, earlier, much earlier than Fukuyama's book, but they are quite similar, and I prefer Fromm's book. That one is called Escape from Freedom. Escape from Freedom. That is uh, directly relevant to the topic of populism and collective identity. So if you are interested in joining that uh, reading group or one of the other two reading, reading groups, I put a link to the descriptions and information about the groups. I've set the subscription, Patreon subscription for the membership uh, as low as I could. The, the main thing is to make the commitment and show up for the meeting and sign up. And th the difficulty is not uh, monetary, but it's with time and the effort to read a relatively difficult book like this. But then the discussions are quite rewarding. Okay, so let's move to the preface. Um, so I'm just going to read. The main issue addressed in this book is the nature and logics of the formation of collective identities. Collective identities. My whole approach has grown out of a basic dissatisfaction with sociological perspectives, which either considered the group as the basic unit of social analysis or tried to transcend that unit by locating it within wider functionalists' or structuralists' paradigms. The logics that those types of social functioning presuppose are, in my view, too simple and uniform to capture the variety of movements involved in the identity construction. Needless to say, methodological individualism in any of its variants, rational choice included, does not provide any alternative to the kind of paradigm that I am trying to put into question. The route I have tried to follow in order to address these issues is a bifurcated one. The first path is to split the unity of the group into smaller unities that we have called demands. The unity of a group is, in my view, the result of an articulation of demands. The unity of a group is the result of an articulation of demands. 
This articulation, however, does not correspond to a stable and positive configuration which could be grasped as a unified whole. On the contrary, since it is in the nature of all demands to present claims to a certain established order, it is in a peculiar relation with that order, being both inside and outside it. As this order cannot fully absorb the demand, it cannot constitute itself as a coherent totality. The demand, however, requires some kind of totalization if it is going to crystallize in something which is inscribable as a claim within the system. All these ambiguous and contradictory movements come down to the, to the various forms of articulation between logic of difference and logic of equivalence discussed in chapter 4. As I argue there, the impossibility of fixing the unity of a social formation in any conceptually graspable object leads to the centrality of naming in constitution in, in constituting that unity. While the need for a social cement to assemble the heterogeneous elements once their logic of articulation no longer gives this affect its centrality in social explanation. Freud had already clearly understood this. The social bond is a libidinal one. My study is completed by an expansion of the categories elaborated in chapter four, logics of difference and equivalence, empty signifiers, hegemony, to a wider range of political phenomena. Thus in chapter five, I discuss the notions of floating signifiers and so social hetero heterogeneity. And in chapter six, those of representation and democracy. So why address these issues through a discussion of populism? Because of the suspicion which I have had for a long time that in the dismissal of populism, far more is involved than the relegation of a peripheral set of phenomena to the margins of social explanation. What is involved in such a dis disdainful rejection is, I think, the dismissal of politics to court and the assertion that the management of community is the concern of an administrative power whose source of legitimacy is a proper knowledge of what a good community is. This has been throughout the centuries the discourse of political philosophy, first instituted by Plato. Populism was always linked to a dangerous excess, which puts the clear-cut molds of a rational community into question. So my task, as I conceive it, was to bring to light the specific logics inherent in that excess, and to argue that far from corresponding to marginal phenomena, they are inscribed in the actual working of any communitarian space. With this in mind, I show how, throughout 19th century discussions on mass psychology, there was a progressive internalization of those features concerning the crowd, which at the beginning, in the work of Hippolyte Taine, for example, were seen as an unassailable excess, but which, as Freud's group psychology showed, are inherent to any social identity formation. I hope to accomplish this in part one. Chapter seven deals with the historical cases which illustrate the conditions of emergence of pop popular identity, while chapter eight considers the limits in the constitution of popular identities. One consequence of this intervention is that the reference of populism becomes blurred because many phenomena which were not traditionally considered populist come under the umbrella in our analysis. Here, there's a potential criticism of my approach to which I can only respond that the reference of populism in social analysis has always been ambiguous and vague. A brief glance at the literature on populism discussed in chapter one suffices to show that it is full of references to the evanescence of the concept and the imprecision of its limits. My attempt has not been to find the true referent of populism, but to do the opposite, to show that populism has no referential unity because it is inscribed not to a delimitable phenomenon, but to a social logic whose effects cut across many phenomena. Populism is, quite simply, a way of constructing the political. And the rest of the preface is uh, acknowledgement of uh, collaborators and people who helped. Uh, the book is divided into three parts and um, eight chapters. Again, if you're interested uh, in joining the group discussions and read this uh, together, please let me know. The links are below. Uh, otherwise, um, 
I'll speak with you in future videos.